What is up, guys? My name is James Blissett, professional gambler and founder of Lucrative MMA, which is my handicapping service where I help people make money from betting on MMA. And today, I'm not only going to help you make money from betting on an MMA, but I'm going to help you make money betting on sports in general. So it's been a hell of a, a year for me. I've gone through the last six months of the year and I have amassed over 90 units of profit this year alone and it's only been six months so personally i've made over a hundred thousand dollars betting on mma this year so it's been a very very good year for me and i've been betting for many years right most of you know me i'm a professional gambler it means i do this full time one of my main sources of income is from gambling but i've been gambling for many years and i wasn't always a professional right i didn't always earn a lot of money from it i have only been able to do that over the last five six seven years um, because of a few things. And one of the things is because I have consistently improved my betting process. When I first started gambling, I was betting $10 bets. I was betting $5 bets. I was betting big, massive multis, right? I wasn't a good gambler. And nowadays, I've proved myself to be one of the best MMA gamblers in the world and have one of the best edges over the MMA markets in the world. And it's all tracked, verifiable proof. But the reason I've done that is because every single year I improve and I become a better gambler. And one of the ways I do that, probably the main ways, is not only by researching other gamblers and getting help off other gamblers, but also by going back and looking at every single bet I've ever placed and determining if that was a good bet or not. So Typically, every quarter, so every three months, I go back and I look at my bets and I see what bets I made. Were they good bets? Were they bad bets? Were they losing bets? Were they winning bets? And why were they good and why were they bad? And then I try and figure out what patterns I'm making, negative and positive, and I try to remove the negative patterns going forward in my gambling, and I try to increase the positive patterns going forward in my gambling. Typically, I do this behind closed doors. I do this in this room. I do this in my front room, wherever it is. I don't do it live, right? But I thought, why not? I might as well go live and give you an insight into how a professional gambler looks back and improves his betting process. Because you can do this too. Just as I do this, you can do this too. And I'm not only going to do that, but I'm going to drop jewels about gambling. Because as you know, I'm most passionate about teaching people how to gamble, not just telling you who I think is going to win in a fist fight, right? Which is most of you know me from talking about fist fights, but I actually prefer to teach people how to gamble because I think it's it's much more important thing than telling you Drickers Duplessis is gonna beat Robert Whitaker on the weekend like I did last week, right? Because that's done now. Drickers Duplessis has already beat Robert Whitaker. We can't go back. You can't make any money on that anymore. But if I tell you how to find an edge in the MMA market. You can make money on that for the next 20 years until that edge disappears. Maybe it disappears in 20 years. Maybe it never disappears. So I think it's much more important, right? So I'm going to bring up my record here and you can just see with me exactly my record. And, and this is tracked on betmma.tips. So this is a third party tracking website, which means I cannot fake my record. Every single bet that I've ever bet here in history since I've been tracked on better made tips is shown here. All my winning bets, all my losing bets, I'm not hiding from anything. Everything is on here. And that's more than I can say about most gamblers. You know, most gamblers in this industry are scammers. They're scumbags. They're scam decappers. And they are not tracked on a variable, verifiable service like this. And if they are, they're gaming the service. Maybe they're inputting incorrect odds. Or maybe they're betting 11 unit bets every single week and they just seem to have a big ROI because some of their 11 unit bets hit or something like that. So as you can see here, I've been right on 807 bets and wrong on 979 bets. So I've been wrong 55% of the time I'm, ro I'm wrong. And it's funny because Lucrative MMA has, become, uh, has come to be quite a big service in the MMA gambling online community. It's a very small community, but obviously I'm, I'm one of the bigger ones. And every now and then I'll get a newbie gambler come to me and say, uh, look, you're wrong 55% of the time. You're wrong more than you're right. You don't even know what you're talking about. So just to educate anybody who's really, really new to sports betting, 
It doesn't matter how much you're right and it doesn't matter how much you're wrong. All that matters is what you've profited and what your ROI is. And that's because we're betting on different type of odds, right? So I can be right 90% of the time. But if all of my bets that I'm betting on were minus 1,000 lines, then I'm actually going to lose money, even though I'm right 90% of the time. On the contrary, if I'm right 45% of the time, but all of the bets I'm betting are plus 150 money lines, then I'm actually going to profit money, even though I'm wrong 55% of the time versus wrong 10% of the time. So just for all the newbies in there who, you know, most of the people who follow me are not newbies, but you never know, there might be some. But yeah, as I said, you can see all of my um, unit losses here. You can see my profits. You can see everything. You can see the stats for the how much money I've made on big favorites, slight favorites, slight underdogs, big underdogs. You can see my handicap of performance over time. So I started at zero units here. My first ever event, I profited 7.55 units, UFC Fight Night 162 in October 2019. And you fast forward to today, July 2023, I've now amassed 391 units over in, in less than a five-year period. Less than a four-year period, actually. I think 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, less than a four-year period. So, oh, you just saw my bets. Oh, you just saw some bets there. I shouldn't have said that. All right. I'm just going to keep it. I'm going to keep it stum. I won't, I won't say anything more. So <laughs> let me go and get my, I'm going to, I'm going to bring up all my handicapper stats, right? And what I'm going to do is basically go, I'm going to go through all of the bets I've made this year and I'm going to basically determine what ones were good and what ones were bad. So we'll scroll, scroll right to the bottom. And I've had a lot of bets this year, guys, so this might take a while. But we're going to scroll right to the bottom. And I want to say shout out to everybody in the chat now. It's quite late, so I don't know if um, that many people are here. You know, I know it's very late, depending on where you are in the world right now. In Auckland, New Zealand, it's uh, 6 p.m. for me, so it's quite late. I know a lot of America are sleeping right now. All right, so I'm all the way down to January. So here we go. So I'm going to bring it up right now. So the first card of the year, I profited 4.82 units. Not bad. Pretty good. So let's just have a look. So the first bet I had was Dan Ige. And this was the biggest bet of the card, you know. Free unit bet against Damon Jackson. And that was a domination from Dan Ige. It was one of my favorite bets of the year. Um, he completely dominated him. And the reason I bet Dan Ige there was because I just knew that he's got very good takedown defense and Damon Jackson basically needs to grapple him to win. I didn't think he could stand a stand a chance on the feet. And what happened? Dan Ige just beat him up on the feet and defended any takedowns. And Dan Ige ended up knocking him out there. The next bet was Roman Kopilov over Punaheli Soriano. And I know I remember a lot of people were on Soriano at that point. Now, the reason I bet Kopilov and was because, yeah, I knew Soriano had potentially some finishing upside on the feet. He could get a big knockout, and I guess he could get some takedowns. But Kopilov showed decent takedown defense against Albert Duraev, who's fighting this weekend. And other than that, he was clearly a better striker than me. He was going to throw more volume. Not only was he going to throw more volume, but he was just a level above in the striking. You know what I mean? It's not sometimes you get fighters... They're going to throw more volume, but they're just not that good. Sometimes they're just going to out-volume their opponents. But he was actually a level above in the striking. And I just thought, you get plus 140 on someone who's a better striker and who has a good chance of defending the takedowns. And on top of that, Punaheli Soriano is a gasser, and Kopilov actually pours it on. So I was just extremely confused as to why I was a plus 140 underdog there. I know a lot of people bet Soriano. And looking back, that was probably a really bad line, you know, because... I mean, plus 140 made no sense, obviously. We had a couple other bets in here. Um, Namogomedov wins by decision. I honestly think that was a, I don't know, man. I think that was a complete random thing that he knocked out Hayani Barcelos. 
I really do. I was extremely surprised he knocked out Barcelos. Um, I think if these guys fight more often than not, Nurmagomedov probably just decisions him. So I'm not, I'm not saying that was a terrible bet. But on the other hand, Umar at this point in time is a level above. And oftentimes when fighters are level above, levels above, things happen. Knockouts happen. So that's something that you need to think about. I need to think about when there's a big level difference. Oftentimes finishes occur, even if the fighter is not a finisher. Right. So the first card of the year, that's the first piece of advice I'm going to give myself. The first piece of advice, and this is something I'm going to look at going forward to see if I overcorrected with the Nomogomedov bet here, right? Because obviously, I think if these guys fight often enough, probably Nomogomedov wins by decision. But Barcelos was old. You know, I know he's still fighting at a decent level, but he is an old guy. He was rocked multiple times by someone in the fight previous to this or the fight before this. I can't remember who it was, but it was the guy he was minus 400 against. Um, the guy who got beat by... Who was the dude who beat Ronnie Barcelos? And he was not... Victor Henry. So Victor Henry is not a power puncher, was knocking Barcelos all over the place. And then the Mergomedov knocked him out. So I could have done better there, you know? I could have done better. I could have looked at it and gone, you know what? I shouldn't really be laying this type of juice because Namagomedov decision, $1.63, that's about minus 160. Minus 160 is a big juice to lay on the decision prop. And looking back at that, even though I feel like maybe Namagomedov would win decision most of the time, it's still not enough for me to bet that price. So I just need to be wary of that going forward, you know. And my other losing bets, let's look at my other losing bets. It was the only two money line bets I lost was a plus 280 and a plus 300, right? So Mateus Mandolka against Javid Basharat. I don't really have any qualms about that. Plus 280. I mean, it's very hard to cover minus 400 lines in MMA, minus 350 like Basharat was at. Did he cover it? He probably did. But for me, Mandonka, like I don't have any regrets on that bet. You know, looking at the Nemergomedov via decision bet, Yes, I am looking at it going, that was probably a bad bet. I'm not looking at the Mandonka one going, that's a bad bet. And again, we have to be objective when we're looking over our bets. The reason is because that's the only way you're going to improve, you know. So I, I, I hope you can tell with this video, and it'll probably be like a half an hour, hour long, probably be like an hour long video. I hope you can tell how objective I am because one of the most important things in MMA is you have to be objective when you're looking over your winning and losing bets. Too common, I see people lose a bet and instantly they moan about the bet and they say that it was a good bet or they say that they got unlucky or they say that it's variance. You have to be objective and understand that a lot of times when you lose a bet, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be because you made a bad bet. You're not better than the market. You're not going to be better than the market on every single bet. A lot of times you're going to be completely wrong, right? And that's just gambling. As long as you can be objective about your wrong bets as well as your winning bets, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine going forward. But the number one issue I see with gamblers is that they cannot be objective after a fight has happened. You know, I called Drickus Duplessis to, to beat Robert Whitaker. I said there was big value on his money line. I said the under was a great price. And I had people after the fight going on Liam's Twitter and saying that Drickers Duplessis wasn't a good bet, even after seeing Drickers knock him out. So that just shows you that people are extremely biased towards their own picks, towards their own predictions. And these people will never make real money from sports betting. They will never make real money, believe me. The reason is because they can't be objective. You have to be objective. It's impossible to succeed if you don't be objective. Even if you're emotional in the moment, which I always preach, preach emotional intelligence and emotional control, more importantly. But even if you are emotional in the moment, don't be emotional a week after. Or don't be emotional in your recap when you go back and look at these bets right now. 
Magomedov wasn't a good bet. I have no qualms about Mendoka or even Jimmy Flick because I know Jimmy Flick looks bad, but at the time, Jimmy Flick, I'm a little bit more upset at the Jimmy Flick bet than I am at the Mendonca bet. I was fine. It was a 50-50 fight in round one, and then he just gassed out, which is fine. Maybe you could have predicted that, but going into it, it's very hard to cover minus 350s. I thought he had some finishing upside. It, it was a it was a fine bet for me to make at the time at plus two eighty. Jimmy Flick, it's a less fine bet. It's plus three hundred, so I give myself a big margin of error, and that's another thing, guys. I feel like I'm going to drop a lot of jewels today. When you're betting on chalk, and especially big chalk, you don't give yourself a big margin for error, meaning that if your read on the fight or on the event or on your bet is wrong, even a little bit then maybe now your bet is not value, right? Whereas if you're betting on plus 300s, big underdogs, then even if your read is off by a little bit, the exact same amount, like if your read is off by 5%, just like in the last example, let's say your read is off by 5% there, you still might have value on your bet because you're giving yourself a massive margin for error at plus 300 in an MMA fight. That's what I think people don't understand about betting big underdogs and betting big favorites, or just underdogs and favorites. Anytime you're betting something with a plus next to its name, right, you're giving yourself much more margin for error on your specific read than you are when you're laying chalk. And by the way, your read's never going to be 100% perfect. I don't, I've been betting in MMA for many years. I don't even know if I've ever had a perfect read. A lot, I've had reads that are almost perfect, but there's always going to be a few things in the fight that happen that you don't envisage. There's always going to be a few things that you you can't predict, right? So for that reason, you need to give yourself as much room for error as possible. And if you're laying big chalk, you just don't give yourself a lot of room for error. That's not to say you can't bet chalk. Chalk is a good way to make money. They're chalk for a reason. They more than likely should win. But the margin for error is a lot less. So you have to be a lot more careful when you're betting chalk. I can bet Mendonca at plus 280 and kick back and not care too much about it because, as I said, it's very hard to cover minus 350 in an MMA fight. But if I'm laying, if I'm betting Dan Ige at minus 125 at a dollar 80, I better be sure Dan Ige is going to win that fight more times than he's not because I'm not giving myself a lot of wiggle room there. So that's just something to be very, very wary of when you're betting on MMA. So it was a very good start to the year for me. Um, the first two. The cards of the year, I won almost five units and then almost nine units. We can call it five unit one and then nine unit one. So massive, massive start to the year. And this is one of the only times I've ever done a four leg parlay. I do have small parlays for fun, most fights, uh, m most cards, just for fun, small amount of money. But this was a decent amount of money. Obviously, it was a one unit shot. Um, it's very rare that I do four leg parlays, but I really liked every single price in these. And um, I just compounded my edge by putting it in a parlay, which is another massively, massively, um, how can I put it? it it's, it's a very foreign concept to a lot of people, parlays, and most people don't understand how parlays work. And I've made a video on that before. Maybe I'll make another video on that one day, but. I just want to address the comments because a few people are messaging me. So Elvis is saying one unit is $1,000 for you. Yeah, so you can see on bettermade.tips that one unit is $500, um, but that's just because I haven't changed it in a long time. One unit is typically $1,000 for me, but it also depends on where I am at the moment. It depends on how much units I've won over a certain amount of time, whether that be the specific calendar year or whether that be the last two years before. It depends what bankroll I'm playing from and how much money I have in that bankroll as well. So it definitely chops and changes. Uh, but for the most part, one unit is $1,000 for me, yes. Greg Lee is saying, quick question. I understand that most bankrolls are 100 unit and the unit size is 1%. You're quite an aggressive gambler. Would you recommend a larger bankroll considering your edge and style is more volatile? So for me, 100 units... Uh, with a unit size at 1% is okay. I definitely am on the more aggressive side of gamblers, but I, I do that for a reason. Obviously, that's why, that's why I'm doing it. 
to be more aggressive, to capitalize on the edge that I have. I wouldn't recommend over 100 units or unit size of 1%. But again, that's a personal preference question because it depends how aggressive you want to be. So you could sign up to my service and play with my style, use a 100 unit bankroll and go 0.5% for every unit which means you'll still get the same amount of bets that I bet on, but you're going a little bit less aggressive with 0.5%. So that's a completely personal preference. You know, when people come out on uh, on Twitter or on social media and say, this is how you should bet, you should never bet over 5% of your bankroll, you shouldn't. When they say these things, it shows me that they do not understand gambling at the professional levels because everybody bets completely different depending on what type of person they are what market they're betting on and what edge they have over that market. So that's a personal question, right? But you don't, you do, I do not have to, I do not recommend the larger role. 100 units at 1% is fine for my betting style. So I've never gone through a downswing of over 100 units um, through any sample size. And so what that means is that no matter what you, um, you know, no matter when you joined me, you would have never lost 100 units. You would have never lost your whole role. So we've definitely gone through downswings, but never nowhere even near 100 units, which I can't say for a lot of people on BetMMA.tips specifically. So if I um, share my screen here. If I share my screen here you'll see that there are some downswings, right? Because this is professional gambling and there's always going to be downswings. So you can see I went upswing, upswing. Here's quite a big downswing, right? It's quite a big downswing. So you can see here we went 271 units, but up here is 301 units. So from here to here, and that, it actually even goes even lower. So this is a really, really low point, right? This is 268 units profit. But about 10 events before that, all the way up here, it was 299 units. So I've lost about 30 units. So it was a 30 unit downswing here, which is the biggest downswing. And you can tell that just by looking at the steepness of the chart. You can tell that this is the biggest downswing. So the biggest downswing I've ever had over a amount of time was 30 units. So even if you had 100 units, the max you would have gone down is, is 30 units. So with that being said, yes, I do recommend a 100 unit bank with a 1% unit size. But like I said, if you're a conservative gambler, you can go 0.5%. If you're an aggressive gambler, even more than me, you can go 1.5%. 1.5% is still okay for my service, considering the chart I've just showed you and the drawdowns expected. Um. Yeah, so shout out to Daz Files. He's ordered my T-shirt, apparently. So I've got a few T-shirts out. I'll promote them at another time, but they're quite, there's some funny things. Actually, this is from my store. So start the day with MMA. So I realized that there's no T-shirts, jumpers, coffee mugs. There's no merchandise out there that has MMA betting stuff on there there's there's no merchandise at all so i was like i want some you know i wanted some coffee mugs with mma gambling i wanted some t-shirts about mma gambling so i was like all right well if there's nothing out there i might as well create it myself and so i did so i now have a um a store which is called fighting and gambling and we basically sell tons of merchandise to do with mma gambling so it, the money i make off this is peanuts i'm making like five six dollars per item some items a little bit more some items a little bit less i didn't make it to make money i just made it because literally nobody else had anything like this out there so i was like fuck it i might as well make it so if you want to support you can go to fighting and gambling it's up here fighting and gambling dot my spreadshot.com um we've got the mma sharp here we've got different designs start the day with mma Gambling is a real job. Juice Boys, Dog Hunter, which is, this is the funny one that everyone was reposting up on Twitter. This was hilarious, I thought. When I was making this, this was so funny. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I might have to buy one of these Dog Hunter t-shirts. I haven't got one yet, but 
Last week was a perfect card for the dog hunter, man. But yeah, um, we'll get back to what we was talking about. Yeah, so Daz is saying it's hard to leave the emotion behind when you've sweated for that money, but you have to. Yeah, man, you have to. You're never going to be better if you don't do that. Um, yeah, so let's carry on and then address the comments uh, again. And if anybody is in here and who has questions for me, just let me know. I'm happy to answer. Questions about anything, I'm an open book. Uh, I'm 100% I'm transparent, as I have always been. If you've got any questions about how to become a professional gambler, how to be a better gambler, I should say, how to bet on MMA, anything, ask me and uh, I'll be happy to answer. So the next card of the year, this was one of my favorite cards of the year because I just smashed this card with like, I smashed this card in every regard, right? So I had Jamal Hill over Glover Teixeira, which he looked minus 400, and I got him over minus 135. So that was a great bet. Brandon Moreno dominated Davison Figueredo, and I just faded him in his next fight against, or, or in the fight recently against Pantoja. So definitely got a good read on Brandon. That was at Pickham. Don't know how that fight was at Pickham. Davison Figueredo just at this point just... He's definitely on a downstream. And then this one, my favorite bets of the year. Bruno Ferreira against Gregory Rodriguez, plus 250. And my man Narco's in here. And so shout out to Narco. Narco's my guy. I'm in his spaces every now and then. Haven't been there in a while. I will get on your spaces soon, Narco. But I've been having a lot of my teammates over for the fights over the last month or so. So I haven't really, I haven't been alone. So I, I haven't been able to jump on. But I definitely will come on there soon. And I remember specifically, I was in Narco space during this card and I just smashed the whole card. And I remember telling everybody and their mother, including John Stargarian, shout out to him. I know he was on the other side because I told him, I think he was on the other side because I told him to bet Bruno Ferreira. And I told everybody in the spaces, 200 people, I said, bet Bruno Ferreira, he's plus 250. And he's going off against Gregory Rodriguez in about five minutes. And there's not going to be an opportunity like this to make money ever again. So you better do it more as like a joke. But obviously, I bet him myself. And we bet him at plus 250, 1.5 unit bet, returned 3.75 units. And not only did we do that, we also bet on him to win via TKO in round one. So very specific. And that was at plus 800. Um, and that was a quarter unit shot. So overall, we won almost six units on Bruno Ferreira. And that was one of my favorite caches of the year. So yeah, that was good, man. Um, and then what else do we have? We have we had Luan Lucerda plus, again, a great bet. Luan Lucerda at plus 280 against Cody Stamen was a great bet. And I'm going to tell you something now. I'm going to be objective, right? This is something that you have to do when you're betting on MMA if you want to improve, which is something I didn't do. And I'm going to tell you exactly now. So I'm going to drop another jaw. I bet Luan Lucerda, as you can see here, at plus 280 against Cody Stamen. And you know what happened when Lu in that fight? Lucerda won the fight. He should have won. It was, a, in my opinion, it was a clear victory. It wasn't that close. He dominated the third round, unarguable. And the first two rounds were 50-50 uh, rounds, maybe even slightly into Lacerda in at least one of the two. So, I mean, you're talking about Cody Stamen was like 10% to get that decision on a judge's scorecards. But somehow he got it. And that was plus 280. So I lost a plus 280 on a split decision. So what I did going into Lacerda's next fight, I overrated Lacerda. Because I had just bet on him as a plus 280 and he was, because I just bet on him as a plus 280 and he was now like a minus 150 in his next fight and I lost that via split decision. I was like, you know what? I have to, <laughs> I see my man Danny is saying, get to training, coach is mad. Oh, bro, T Danny, tell coach that I have to pay the bills, man. <laughs> Oh, man. Danny's one of my training partners there. Um, upcoming MMA fighter. He's going to be in the UFC one day. But anyway, bro, um, throw me off. Yeah, so I bet on Luan Lacerda at plus 280. So in his next fight, I wanted to bet on him again because I'm like, this guy's a G. He he won me, or he almost won me a plus 280 underdog. So I bet on him in his next fight when I shouldn't have done it. And my man, Narco, he told me not to do it. My man, Narco, said Blackshear is the one. And I know... 
Narcos just got back from Vegas. I know he was out in Vegas doing um, poker. So, yeah, I'm glad you're back to the grind now. Back to back to MMA betting. Hopefully you've done well at poker, my man. We'll definitely catch up soon. But my man Narco told me. He said, listen, don't bet on um, Luan Lucerda. Black Shear is a good underdog here. But I made a massive mistake of overrating Lucerda because of his previous performance that I bet on. And this is something that everybody will do in MMA gambling. Nobody is immune to this. When you bet on a fighter and they lose via the split decision or they almost win, especially as a big underdog, you're going to tend to overrate them going forward. And that's exactly what I did with Luan Lucerda. I've been in the game for years. I shouldn't really be doing that. But I did. So I'm always learning. 2023, I'm still learning. And that's something that everybody needs to be aware of. If you bet on someone and they narrowly lose, do not overrate them in the next fight just because they should have won their last fight. This happens a lot. And the market overrates them. The market overrated Luan Lucerda. And then I did as well. I overrated him even more. But the market overrated Lucerda because he just went to a 50-50 fight with Cody Stamen. So the market overrated him. And then I overrated him even more than the market. So that's a lesson learned. I should have listened to the man Narco, but I didn't. He had Bruno Kale won at plus. Yeah, I remember. Me and you was on the spaces. And I remember we both cashed that one. It seems like we cash a lot when I'm on your spaces. I don't know if that's biased, but I feel like whenever I'm in there, we both do well. Yeah, so, I mean, this was a good card. I had Daniel Marcos, which was, again, one of my favorite caches of the year. He completely dominated the fight as a plus 140 underdog. Ended up getting the finish, which I definitely didn't think he would do. And then this was a chalk parlay. Um, I'm not going to go into parlays now because I can't be bothered. But basically, there's nothing wrong with parlays. Let me just put it that way. People are completely mistaken about parlays. Parlays can be used to your benefit drastically, especially these days, getting around limits and also um, getting bookmaker bonuses and stuff like that. Sometimes they give those out on certain markets, certain bookmakers as well, but that's neither here or there. So it was a very good event. I had a five-unit bet on Glover Teixeira versus Jamal Hill under four and a half rounds. Was there any value at $1.22? I'd like for somebody to let me know because I don't know. I feel like maybe, but maybe I just overrated the, uh, underrated the toughness of Glover Teixeira. I, I, re I really don't know. We got some, why is it always the people with no faces? Someone saying I'm a liar. I, I haste not made those bets. What does haste not made those bets? I think you need to go to back to school and learn how to spell, and then also become a man in your own life so you're not on somebody's YouTube channel trying to troll because right now you're not a man of merit. And it's important in the world to be a man of merit, somebody who's actually doing something in life. Making incorrect spelling words and calling someone who a, li a liar is not a good use of your time, young man. Um, so I don't know, man. I'd like for you guys to let me know whether you think there was any value at a dollar twenty-two, which is not good, guys. That's minus four fifty. So was there any value at the fight doesn't go to decision at minus four fifty? Is it possible that that fight doesn't go to decision nine out of ten times? Probably not. That probably doesn't go to decision about maybe eight out of ten times. So probably there was no value at a at dollar twenty-two. Um, but yeah, man, I'm not sure. So let me just ban this guy. He's just a weirdo. Can't even speak. Can't even speak English, bro. So Kyrix is saying lucrative. I bet Jamal Hill inside the distance instead of money line like a bozo. Yeah, that's definitely a bozo, bro. And the reason is because they already give you a nice price on money line. You know, oftentimes I like to bet inside the distance if there's a massive drastic shift. I know there wasn't a massive shift in this. So I have to agree you was a bozo in that circumstance. But that's something you can learn. I was a massive bozo betting Lacerda in his next fight as a favorite. So we're all bozos at times in the MMA betting or in betting in general. We just have to learn from being our bozos. You know what I mean? We have to learn from our bozo move. So that's all, all good. The next event, we had a, a terrible event on PFL. And it's just funny, isn't it? Because I remember loads of people messaging me. So we had we crushed the first two events. Not only did we win a lot, we just made really good bets. 
And then I remember losing on this event here. It was a bad event. We lost four units. And I remember a lot of people saying stuff like, um, or a lot of people messaging me like, wow, you're a fraud, terrible. And I, oh, it's just like brain numbing. It's like, I just smashed 10 units, nine units on that event, five units on that event. I lost four units and you're losing your shit. It's just like, these people will never, ever, ever make any money gambling. You know, I have a tipping service, right? And I have to because I can't get that much money down consistently every single week because I get banned from everywhere I ever go, right? So the tipping service is needed for me to get the amount of money down um, because I can't get the amount of money down that I want. So I deal with people from the tipping service often and every like I get a lot of people coming in for a week or two and leaving after a losing week. And these people have complete loser broke mindsets because their mindset is get rich quick scheme that's their mindset and if you if you have a get rich quick mindset automatically you're a loser because you will lose at life but second of all you will basically never ever be successful in anything in life because you want the quick fix you live in a mic your brain is like a microwave brain you want to put something on for 60 seconds and then instantly make it. So you want to join up for one event, PFL, and win money. That's not what happens. But obviously, gambling, unfortunately, gambling has done a lot for me in my life. I've made a lot of money from gambling. But gambling also, also draws in the bottom of society, unfortunately, because it's an addictive thing. And the bottom of society are always going to stay at the bottom of society because they don't have the brains, the knowledge, the self-awareness to make it to the top of society. And the bottom of the society, bottom of society are people who want to join for one week and win lots of money. And if they join during the PFL and they lose, they leave the service and they start complaining and they start moaning. These people are the same people who are at the bottom of the society. People who have really bad jobs that they hate, people will never make a lot of money. Those are the same people. And I deal with these people a lot because I have a tipping service, just one and the same. But I just want to say, if, you, if you're watching this and you don't want to do the tape yourself, you don't want to grind away 40 hours a week, 30 hours a week doing tape, you don't want to bet yourself, you want to come to a professional like myself or any other tipping service, just make sure that you're not at the bottom of society. Make sure you have some self-awareness to understand that there's going to be some drawdowns. I'm going to win a lot of events. Like you can see here, won this event, won this event. But I did lose this event. But a lot of people would have joined for this PFL and they would have lost their money. And then they would have left the, they would have left the service and they would literally, one day later, on the 3rd of February to the 4th of February, they would have missed out on my best event of the year. This event was an insane event. And we've got Mario, who actually is the same guy as you, Park. He's coming back. Bro, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm saying this because I care about humanity and men in general. I try to help men, right? Going on YouTube and commenting lies and troll comments on a niche MMA gambler like myself is not a good use of your time. You're wasting your time in life. Your life is precious. One day you're going to die. You probably don't have a lot of money. You're probably broke. You're probably a loser because you wouldn't be doing this. You need to fix your life. I'm not saying this in a negative, horrible way. I'm being genuine. Don't waste your time doing this. Go and improve your life. You only get one life. I say that wholeheartedly. So Narco saying, yes, come into spaces this weekend. Maybe, bro. Kyrix is saying, if I don't have anyone over, I will, but I, I might. Kyrix is saying, I made a rule for myself to never bet inside the distance if money line is almost the same. Yeah, exactly. So let's get back to this event. This was a massive, massive event. So first bet, Jalen Bates. Free unit bet plus 300. Massive, massive amount of bet. I I just thought that this this should be evens, and so I bet it, and it looked like an evens fight. Uh, maybe I had some luck with the decision because it went to split decision, but, I mean, it was obviously a great bet. Jalen Bates just grappled him. was a very close fight. 
We also had Lorenz Larkin, and he knocked out Mukhmed Berkamov. And then we had Grant Nil, who another close fight, but we managed to get the win. And then we cashed on our parlay, both parlays, five parlay legs, all win. So, I mean, we completely destroyed this card. This was the best card of the year. I only laid out 13 units on this card, but I managed to get back 21.73 units. So that made for a 167% ROI. So this is probably the bit, one of the best cards I've ever had ever, because not only did I make a massive unit profit, but I also bet on all plays were plus money plays, every single play. And my ROI was huge. And not only that, I swept the whole card. So probably in my entire MMA gambling career, this would have, would, this would have been one of my biggest nights of all time. And it, it was. So there's nothing I really learned here. I don't want to really, I mainly only want to bring up my losses in this live stream because I mean, I can speak about my wins, but for the most part, I want to speak about my losses because that's really where the, that's really where the growth comes from. It's, it's the losses. So Frank is saying, um, good gambling requires discipline. Most gamblers are degenerates who by nature have little discipline. So few like yourself will succeed. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Like I said, gambling, unfortunately, does draw in the degenerates because it's an addictive thing. Anything addictive like drugs, um, I don't, you know, bad food, you know, this type of stuff draws in those who are weak minded. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. And so it does draw in the degenerates, the bottom of society. So most people don't win long term. That's just the fact of the matter, man. You have to have people who understand the game and people who don't understand the game. That's just yin, yin and yang. That's dark and light. We can't stop it. It is what it is. Narco saying, ignore these idiots. <laughs> don't give them advice. They are miserable. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm just having a bit of fun with it. But at the end of the day, um, like I said with gambling, man, like I said, like that's yin and yang. There's dark and light. You know, there's positive, successful people like me. And then there's unhappy, miserable, unsuccessful people like the guy who was commenting. So it's just yin and yang. I don't, I understand that there has to be that. There has to be haters. For that, for there to be successful people, there has to be haters. So it is what it is. And I was just giving the guy some advice, you know. Hopefully he can turn his life around and become successful and not become a loser, you know, typing on YouTube comments. Hopefully, one I genuinely wish that for him. I genuinely wish that for these people who are, like, he's come again. The same guy now. I genuinely wish that for the people who troll online that they can improve their life. But, I mean, most of them, they won't. But I do wish that. Um, so this event, it was a decent event. Nothing special. I will say, though, that I got robbed on this event because I had Zayi at plus 200, a 3.5 unit bet. I thought he won the fight. If it didn't win the fight, it was a 50-50 fight. And when you lose a split decision like I did on a plus 200 or a close decision or a 50-50 decision on a plus 200, it's very, very upsetting because you did your job, right? I did my job there. I I looked at the fight. I realized that there was value on this Zayi. I bet on him. I bet on value. And the judges take it away from me. So that was tough, but it was what it was. Um, we also had a four-unit bet on Maichin Taibora over Ivanov. We had the under two and a half rounds in a Park Tulum fight. We had the under two and a half rounds in a Kinoshita Fugit fight. Tyra wins inside the distance against Aguilar. That was up at minus 190, but that was an easy one. So yeah, man, uh, we had a lot of bets here. This was a decent card. Let's look at my, um, look, even this one, this Sungjuk Guk, this should have been a massive card, you know. Trust me. This should have been a massive card. So Sung Guk Choi versus Hyung Sung Park, under two and a half rounds. That was plus 180. That finished. The fight ended inside the distance, but it was over two and a half rounds. In my opinion, that was a decent bet. Zayi obviously was an amazing bet. Those two, like the Zayi should have got the decision. So instantly, that should have been a 3.5 unit plus, what's that? Two, four, six. Jesus. 
So this is basically a 10 unit swing. And then this here is 1.5, it's like a four unit swing. So realistically, I should have had 14 more units in this. So this should have been like a 16 unit event. Instead, it was a 1.96 unit event. So you can see how small margins in MMA and especially in gambling can kind of fuck you. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, it was a good card. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about this one. Um, there's not too many lessons there for me. This this card was epic, wasn't it? This was the Alexander Volkanovsky versus Islam Makachev card. I was like the only guy with a bet on uh, Alexander Volkanovsky. Felt vindicated in that spot. I got plus 300 on Alexander Volkanovsky. Felt like it was a good bet. I feel like with a few adjustments, Alexander could have won that fight. I also felt it was a very close fight. I thought it could have been a split decision the first time I saw it. I think 3-2 to Makachev seems to be the consensus opinion. You know, a 3-2 decision on a plus 300. Someone who actually outpaced Makachev with the with, with the cardio and actually had more cardio at the end of the fight and was on top of him, pounding him away. I don't mind that. You know, I, I don't mind that bet. Oh, I think it was a good bet on Alexander Volkanovsky before um, before the fight. And I, and I definitely think it was a good bet after the fight. It just didn't go our way. I also played Parker Porter as an underdog against Justin Tuffer. I mean... Maybe I underrated Parker Porter's ability to take a shot. Maybe I underrated Justin Tuffer's ability to land a shot. But it's hard to say, man. You know, it's very hard to say what the true line of a fight is after one fight. But I think Parker Porter probably outvolumes this guy a good amount of time that they fight, you know. But then he probably gets caught a lot. So I'm not going to say too much about this. This Jimmy Crook bet here, this was a bad bet. Bad bet from... From me, a really terrible bet. Why am I laying that price on Jimmy Crew? Probably one of the worst bets of the year I've made is Jimmy Crew at, I thought I bet him at minus 170, 160. I, that says minus two, 210 or 225. Jesus, if I bet Jimmy Crew at minus 225, call me a square because that was a square play. That fight played out 50 50 pick em. And in their fight recently, that fight played out Alonzo favorite. I do think that was because Jimmy was extremely scared of getting beat to a pulp like the first fight. So I don't think that is a true representation of the fight. I think the true representation of the fight is the first fight where Jimmy's having a lot, getting his game off a lot. But obviously, minus 225 is absolutely insane. Um. Yeah, what else did we have here? We had the under and the Jack Della fight. Um, this was a bad bet from me, kind of. Elvis Brenner versus Zubara Tahuga. I thought Brenner was going to come forward, push the pace, and basically make himself get knocked out by Tahuga. And I think going over Brenner's career, if we look at it, he definitely does do his utmost to make the fight not go to decision. But on the other hand, I bet on a massive favorite getting a finish. You know, Tahugov was a big favorite. I thought he would be the one getting the finish. He was minus 400, but he lost the fight. And not only that, Tahugov doesn't do much. So I bet in under two and a half rounds with one fighter who doesn't really throw a lot of strikes. Tahugov doesn't really do much at all. So why am I laying a big amount of money on an under with a guy who doesn't really throw his hands? The fight can't get finished. The fight can't go under two and a half rounds if you don't throw your hands. And so this was definitely a mistake for me. I will rarely, rarely ever bet a Tahugov under ever again. It was just a big mistake for me. What more can I say? I'm going to learn from that going forward. I'm going to learn from that where if a fighter doesn't throw his hands, I shouldn't be betting the under two and a half. And yeah, that's it. Not much more to say about that one. Um, I also made that under two and a half rounds in the Yair Rodriguez versus Josh Emmett fight. I thought that was a solid bet there. Plus 150 is a decent price. Um, Jenkins inside the distance, didn't cash that, almost cashed it. Pedro Bukowskis under, didn't cash that, didn't really almost catch it. So yeah, I mean, this was a, it was a decent event. It was all right. I managed to get profit, so I'm always going to be happy with that. We ended up profiting 1.18 units. Could have been a bit better. Could have been worse. I could have lost the draw with Jimmy Crute. 
Uh, and there was a few other things. So, yeah, but I think the, the main the main thing I want to take away from this one is why are you betting Zubaira to Hugov um, to basically to finish when the guy doesn't throw strikes? And I'm going to speed it up from now, guys, because we're already gone 50 minutes and I only wanted this to be about an hour and a half. So I'm going to speed up and I'm not going to go through every event. I'm only going to go through the events that I think are important to learn from. So one of the events that I want to speak about, let me just brag a little bit. I had Aaron Blanchford over Jessica Andrade. I thought that was an amazing bet there. Um, yeah, I guess I could learn from this one, guys. So I had Jordan Wright versus Zach Paulga to go under two and a half rounds at massive chalk at minus 400. And the reasoning behind this bet prior to the fight was that Jordan Wright's a madman and he goes under versus everyone. But what I failed to cap in was that Zach ba pa Zach Pauga is not a madman and that he doesn't go under with anyone, right? So Zach Pauga will clinch him up against the cage like he did in that fight and make the fight as boring as possible. He's got some decent power in his hands, but if, if Jordan Wright was ever going to go to decision, it was going to be against Zach Pauga. So I think what I can learn from this fight and what I'm going to do better of going forward in the future which is the whole point of this video and the whole point of this exercise is I need to look at both fighters. If I'm only giving one fighter a chance of finishing the fight, either he finishes himself or he gets finished, then I need to be very careful lay a massive chalk. If this was minus 110, it's fine, right? But basically in my eyes, it was like Jordan Wright is going to dictate whether this fight goes under two and a half rounds. It's not going to be down to Zach Poalga. But Zach Poalga is still in the fight. So why am I almost completely ignoring him? Jordan Wright, I think, had never been over one and a half rounds before, apart from the fight before that against Dusko Todorovic, which went over one and a half, but went under two and a half, right? So I thought, you know, historically, this guy never, he's never gone to a decision. He's not going to go to a decision now. But he did. And I was just completely overrating or underrating Zach Puelga's lack of urgency in there. And he was just happy to win the decision. So, yeah, there's definitely something I can learn going forward. It's not all about historics. For the most part, it is. But you really have to look at the matchup. And I think in that, in that circumstance, I ignored the historics and I only looked at the matchup. Sorry, I ignored the matchup and I only looked at the historics. Because I remember thinking... I remember legitimately thinking to myself that, damn, Puelga's not a finishing threat at all. But it's Jordan Wright. It'll be fine. Silly. Silly, silly, silly. And I'm going to learn from that going forward. So this was another Bellator event. We've done really well here. Um, look, we smashed it. Jeremy Kennedy, Bryce Logan, good underdog. Richie Smullen, good underdog. Um, Storley lost as a plus 140 underdog against Amosov. Look, I don't, I don't have any regrets on that bet. I didn't learn anything from that bet. It was a bad bet. It was a terrible bet, but I didn't learn anything from it. And I don't think it was a bad bet going in. So a bad bet going in is not always a bad bet coming out. And from the first fight, Storley and Amosov, I thought that a five-round fight, Storley at plus 140, that was fair. That was a fair bet. I'm not going to sit here and go wow, I should have known anything. Because from the historics and from watching their first fight, I don't really see how I made a terrible bet at plus 140, even though it turned out to be a terrible bet. It was very hard for me to know that going in. So you have to differentiate. Yes, it might end up being a terrible bet, but going into the fight, was it? Was the, the knowns versus the unknowns, was it a terrible bet? I think even... Even going into this Jordan Wright versus Paolga fight, that was a terrible bet. Going into it and coming out of it was also a terrible bet. Going into the Storley fight, I don't think this was a terrible bet. Coming out of it, it was a terrible bet. So there's a difference there. Um, yeah, maybe obviously I should have rated uh, Amosov's grappling chops a little bit better. I knew his striking was better. So all he had to do was defend takedowns. It's harder to get a takedown than to defend the takedown. It takes more energy. So yes, yes, obviously there was things I overlooked. But in general, I, I don't have massive regrets on the way I played it, um, really, yeah. The next fight, uh, the next 
fight night. Brendan Allen, I don't know why he was a plus 185 underdog to Andre Muniz. He's clearly the better striker, and Muniz doesn't really have great wrestling. So, And, and Brendan Allen's very, very good jiu-jitsu. He submitted Andre Muniz there, which is quite epic. Um, Don Talmaze over Augusto Sakai. So, yeah, guys, I definitely have something to confess here. And I confess that it was a bad, bad bet. The reason is because I just thought, like, Sakai was on a downslope. But this is something I need to learn going forward. Just because someone's lost their last four fights doesn't mean they're completely washed. Look at Dan Hooker. He went on, like, a four-fight loss streak. And then he came back and he beat um, that, that knee bar guy. Claudio Pules beat him, and I bet on Dan there. And they beat Jalen Turner, who's one of the top guys in the division. So just because you may look washed, just because you've lost three, four fights in a row, doesn't mean you're going to lose the next one. It's matchup dependent. And in this fight, Sakai was taking a massive step down in competition, and he was just too much for Mays. But why? I didn't bet on Mays because I thought Mays was much better. I bet on Mays because I thought Sakai was done. So that's something I need to learn going forward. And another thing I need to learn, another lesson I'm taking. So even me as a full-time gambler, somebody who makes a lot of money from gambling, I'm still learning on almost every card. This shit never ends, guys. Never ends. That's why if somebody tells you that they know what they're talking about and they're the best gambler of all time, don't even listen to them because they're probably talking shit. Let's scroll up and see some recent ones and then I'm going to... I'm going to jump off because I do have things to do. And I think you get the point of this exercise, right? I don't need to go through. And look at this. This was a bad card. Terrible card for money lines. Jesus. We'll go over every single one of them as well. Um, that wasn't a bad card, though. Like, I won decent amount on other bets, but terrible, terrible bets as well. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say was, I'm not going to go through every single loss I've ever made. I think you understand the concept of this, right? And the whole point of this video was, I'm going to do this exercise, whether you're watching or not, but I wanted to make it live because I wanted to help you do the same thing. I think everybody should be keeping a track of all of their bets, win or loss or draw. And very regularly, every three months, six months, nine months, going through all of the bets and determining if it was a good bet or if it was a bad bet and why and what lessons can you learn. You've already seen me live in front of you right now learn about three or four lessons. And this is someone who's been gambling for 15 years, 10 years consistently. So you can do the same. And that's the whole point of this video is to let you know that you need to be doing the same. So with that being said, I'm not going to go through every single event here. I think you get the point of the video, but we will still continue because there's probably a lot of mistakes that I made on here that you also made. And maybe if I verbalize it in a way, you'll understand that you made the mistake as well. So yeah, look, Cyril Garn versus John Jones. I think most people will um, be shocked to hear this, but I do not regret this bet at all. So on one hand, yes, you don't bet against the GOAT. But you know what? Everybody was saying the exact same thing when Al Jermaine fought Henry Cejudo. Don't bet against one of the greatest of all time. We saw John Jones come back after four years and defeat Cyril Garn. Don't bet against Cejudo. And what happened? Cejudo lost, right? So I don't think it's just as easy as saying don't bet against the best fighter of all time because Anderson Silva lost. GSP lost. Everybody loses, right? It's just when they lose. It's just a matter of when they lose. Some people retire before they can lose, like Khabib Nurmagomedov. But some people argue that Gleason Tebow won that fight, you know? So maybe he lost as well. What I'm trying to say is John Jones is the GOAT is not a good enough argument as to why you shouldn't bet against him with someone like Cyril Garn as an underdog when John Jones had never fought in the heavyweight division and was making the biggest step up in any weight division was going from 205 pounds to a potential 265 pounds 
who didn't look in good physical shape, who was out of the octagon for four plus years. I mean, I have no regrets on this bet at all. Obviously, I regret losing the money, but I have no regrets in placing the bet because I think my hypothesis behind placing the bet was completely rational and understandable. Like I said, there was all, all those reasons I placed the bet. And it was my smallest money line bet of any money lines that evening, right? So it's not like I smashed him. I did play Gun Decision as well because I thought he was outpointing him if he was going to win. But hindsight's 2020. Yeah, he had no grappling, but you don't know how John's going to look 60 pounds heavier. It's impossible to know that. You don't know how John's going to look four years away from the sport. Like, there's things you just don't know, right? And Cyril was active at the time. So I have no qualms about playing that bet whatsoever. Um, and I don't learn any lesson there. The only lesson I could potentially learn is like that I under that I overrated Cyril's grappling. But it's, it, it's like a macro play for me, right? I don't look at this. Like in these type of plays, I'm not going... John has a really good front headlock series. He's really good at cinching up that guillotine in the fight with Francis and Garnu. Um, when Cyril Garn was turtling, he put his neck up. John will be able to get the choke because he has this good technique. I'm not looking at specific techniques. That's not a good way to play MMA gambling every single fight. Some fights call for that, but for the most part, macro, look at it in a macro scale. Who's going to throw more volume? Who has the more physicality? Who has the better chin? Who's been fighting at a higher level rather than he's really good at this specific joint lock and that guy might be susceptible to that joint lock. That's usually the, the former is better than the latter when you're looking at breaking down MMA fights. And for me, this was an easy macro bet. You know, you could you could chop and change John Jones for anyone else there. I would still play it or chop and change Cyril Garn for anyone else for the most part, right? At that level, same level. And I would still play it because it was the fade rather than a specific matchup bet. I wasn't betting on the matchup. I was betting on the circumstances around the matchup, which didn't plan out for me this time. But a lot of times it will plan out for me. Like if you bet against Robbie Lawler this weekend because he was talking about retirement, that didn't work out for you. But for the most part, if you bet against fighters that are one foot in, one foot out, talking about retirement, you will be profitable. You wasn't this weekend on Robbie Lawler, but most of the time you will be. And let me tell you now, if you bet against fighters moving up to heavyweight, 60 pound jump, looking terribly out of shape with a beer belly, with a gut belly, getting into legal troubles, video of him drunk 12 months prior to that, um, can't even walk straight. All of the, you know, popping for steroids for years and years and years and then now potentially not being on any. Like all of this stuff, right, you will win long term. And like I said, John Jones, who's the greatest of all time, is not a is not enough of a rebuttal prior to that fight. Um, Jalen Turner versus Mateus Gamrock plus 180, free in a bet. I think that's a, a very good bet. Um, the fight played out evens. A lot of people scored it for Jalen Turner. Uh, not too much to learn from that one. I think it was a great shot at fading Gamrot at plus 180. Um, what else we got? Ian Gary wins by decision. Yeah, this was very annoying because the fight got to about 60 seconds left and then he ended up winning the knockout. So that uh, winning via knockout. So that was very, very annoying. Um, I think for me here, what I do learn is that maybe I just went, I mean, I'm, it's not even that I learned. I just had the wrong read on the Garn and Jones fight. It's not like it's a massive thing I need to overcorrect. Sometimes, and, and this is something I want to say now as well. Sometimes you'll just have a wrong read on something. It doesn't mean you have, there's a massive lesson that you have to learn. Or I hate when, like, this is what happens a lot of times on MMA Twitter. Someone will lose a fight and then there'll be a massive narrative as to why he lost it. Like Robert Whitaker this weekend. Oh, Robert Whitaker's done. He's a terrible fighter. Um, you know, maybe he hasn't got any motivation. There's this massive, there's articles written about it. There's tweets written about it. There's threads written about it. There's all these things surrounding why Robert Whitaker lost. Why can't it be that Duplessis wanted it more than him? He's got that dog in him. He has way more finishing upside uh, than him. He Robert doesn't have a great chin. Why can't it just be that Duplessis just won the fight on the day. Why does it have to be this massive narrative surrounding everything? Like, 
there's always a big narrative surrounding a lot of fights. Sometimes you're just like, the guy just got beat. It is what it is. It doesn't mean anything happened. And the same thing with your bets. Yes, obviously, I got the wrong read here because I thought Jones was going to come back looking diminished. But he didn't. But let me tell you, if he did come back looking diminished, which was basically impossible to know by anybody, then I probably would have cashed the plus 135. I probably would have cashed the over two and a half rounds. You know what I mean? So it, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a fine line between understanding what you did wrong and also understanding that you can't get everything right. And it's just the read on that occasion was just wrong. Um, what else we got? So Duplessis to win in round two and to win in round three. I think that was really, really good bets against Derek Brunson there. I really, really like that spot. Um, Garbrandt via decision. That was another really good bet. And this was just a tough card to lose money on, man. Because, like, look, I won seven and a half units on that Garbrandt decision play there. I also bet Shavkat Rachmanov to win in round three, which is my only bet on the entire fight, which cashed five units. So it's just kind of annoying. When you're cashing a parlet, uh, when you're cashing a prop for five units, and when you're cashing a prop for seven and a half units, and then you still lose money, it's just a tough pill to swallow, but it is what it is. We'll move on. Um, Usman versus Benson Henderson. I know he finished him in round one, but he basically head kicked him, and then off that head kick, he just got a submission. I don't have much to say about this one. Let's scroll up. Oh, damn, look, this was a big losing event on the props, but... This was close, though, man. Victor Henry, I thought he was going to win in round two. And then in round three, Gravely just came back. It was mad. And the sub was so live in round three, almost cinched up a sub. Like, that shit was close. This was a terrible read. So this is one I want to speak about. I had a very, very bad read on this fight. Peter Yan versus Murad Devalishvili. Yan to win in round three, round four, and round five. Now, just like the last event, I don't want to sit here and go in-depth on how much I need to learn. I just want to admit that I had a bad read on this one. Just because you have a bad read, it doesn't mean that there's a massive thing to learn. And I think that's what a lot of people are going to make a mistake at. They're going to be like, oh, I had a bad read on the fight. Now I really need to completely adapt to my betting process. Maybe your read was just wrong. It doesn't mean your betting strategy was wrong, which is really what we're trying to improve here. You can't improve your read that much by looking at your previous bets. You can only do that by watching MMA again and again and again and again and again and again and, again. and then eventually you can kind of understand how matchups will unfold. You improve your betting strategy by doing this. Yeah, you improve your read a little bit because you remember how fights went and you kind of keep that in as a mental note going forward. But for the most part, this exercise is to improve your betting strategy, not your read. So if you have a bad read, but the strategy was fine, then relax. So in my opinion, these bets are completely fine for the exercise we're talking about now. So these bets are terrible in one regard. So I, I really hope people understand the differentiation I'm trying to make here. So on the one hand, these bets are terrible because Marab destroyed Yan and I had the wrong fighter to win in round three, four and five. But that was because my read on the fight was extremely wrong. The bets themselves are completely fine because instead of laying minus 250, minus 300 on Yan's money line, I only played a half a unit shot on his inside the distance lines at in round three, four, and five. And I think hindsight, I was correct. Marab had never been five rounds before. And I was expecting Marab to slow down because I didn't think he would have extended grappling success. It just so happened that um, Marab Devalishvili actually had one of the best cardio showings in MMA, not just UFC, but in MMA history and potentially all of sports history, which it's not easy to predict somebody having one of the best cardio performances in sports history pre-fight. It's not easy to predict that, is it? So I think these bets are completely fine. I have nothing to learn here. The only thing I can say here is that I had a terrible read on the fight. And for that reason, these bets were terrible. They were really bad bets. But in terms of my strategy and learning going forward, I have nothing to learn. I'm glad that I strategized this fight 
by playing the three, four, and five. I'm happy. Looking back on these bets, I did well. So it, it, it's, a, uh, it's a paradox, right? On the one hand, they were terrible bets. On the other hand, they were really good bets in terms of the strategy I employed to bet them. I just had a very bad read on the fight. So if you can understand these type of concepts, you're going to be a, a much better gambler going forward because you're not going to overreact to a loss or a win. You know, there's some people who will overreact. And instead, like, there's the people I mentioned earlier who, when they lose a bet, they're like, no, 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 I was lucky. I shouldn't have lost. But then there's the other people who, anytime they lose a bet, they're like, oh, terrible bet. Can't believe I've done that. These people are just as bad as the people who say that they got robbed or, or, or that it was a lucky knockout. You know, these people are just as bad, the people who instantly slander their bets just because it lost. Because you have to look at the process of why you played the bet, not just what happened in the fight. Big differentiation there. This is so, so important. That last two, three, four, five minutes I just said, that is so important, guys. I can't stress that enough. I hope everybody understands what I was saying, and I hope I verbalized it and explained it well enough so you can understand me because it's such an important part of MMA gambling. Going back and looking at your strategy, not the specific bet and the iteration, why you made the bet. That's why I said I had no regrets on the Cyril Garner versus John Jones, but I have massive regrets on the Palga and Bukowskis one. And I had re some regrets on the Jimmy Flick over Charles Johnson one, but I had no regrets on the Mondonka over Basharat one. It's so important, guys. Um, so I do have regrets on this one. So I played Alexander Volkov, uh, Alexander Volkov to win in round two and Alexander Volkov to win in round three. Now, in some regard, I also had his money line as an underdog there, of course, right? So in terms of the strategy, it's not that bad because I still ended up profitable on this fight. I played the money line for big money. And then I went small money for the inside the distance round two and round three. So I don't have massive qualms about how I bet it, but I do have some, there is some regrets. And the reason is because I should have just bet his inside the distance. If I'm laying a unit on his round two and round three, I should be betting his inside the distance. Now I know that the inside the distance would have been plus 250 versus I'm getting plus 900 on the round two and plus 1200 on the round three. But the thing that I failed to realize is that this, this is a heavyweight fight. Volkov is a heavyweight. Heavyweights, when they get knockouts, they are, um, they are early a lot of the time. So it was no surprise when Volkov knocked him out early. I was predicting that Volkov would have a tough first round and come back. But in hindsight, even though I don't hate the way I played it because I still played the money line, I should have just stuck with it inside the distance there because there was no guarantee that Volkov had to come through a tough round one. But on the other hand, Romanov had shown in every round one, he looks tough before that. And this was the only fight where he rocked up looking awful. So it's tough, isn't it? Um, so yeah, we'll carry on because like I said, don't want to be a forever. Um, Gabriel Santos, that was a really good bet there. I think he won against um, Lauren Murphy, plus 145. Great bet. Unfortunately, it just didn't cash. And I lost nine units here. So this is probably one of the worst events of the year. But guess what? If Gabriel Santos would have won, I would have... If Gabriel Santos would have won, I would have won the event. So even though I lost almost 10 units, one of my worst event ever, I still should have won this event because we've got a split decision loss to Laura Murphy, which was a robbery. Santos clearly won the fight. Clearly won the fight. So it's crazy, isn't it? Like, this was one of my worst events of the year, but I should have won this event. So it's, it's just weird how it plays out. But on top of that, terrible, terrible, terrible bets I've laid. I mean, Miller via TKO, she got dominated in that fight. I shouldn't have trusted someone on Juliana Miller's level to win the fight. No matter what I thought about Veronica Macedo, I maybe shouldn't have trusted her. Fizaya via KO, I really thought he was going to knock Justin out, but he didn't. So some bad bets here as well, man. This was a bad event for me because I, I I I bet on Leon Edwards to win inside the distance. I should have just played his money line. It was massive, but it is what it is. Um, let's scroll up and see. So these are me just sweeping this uh, Fury card. One FC doing quite well here. I'm just going to scroll up and I'm going to see if there's anything else I want to look for. Bellator here continuing to be 
um, good money for us. And if anybody's made it this far, we see oh, my man Nav. I just got on the elite plan. Yeah, so Nav has signed up. Naz has signed up for the UFC. Um, sorry, for the, the elite plan on my website. So what that is, is I have two packages on my website. I have the standard package and the elite package. With the standard package, you get the UFC betting tips, PFL betting tips, and Bellator betting tips. For the elite package, you get all of those, and you get the regional scene betting tips, which are literally what we showed up here. They're the LFA bets. They're the one bets. They're the Fury FC bets. They're the Cage Warriors bets. So if you signed up and you was on a standard plan this week, on this week, um, you wouldn't have got any of these bets. But if you was, you would have earned three, four, what's that? Eight, eight point. You would have earned about five units in profit. That's five units extra than you would have earned on the standard plan. On top of that, on the elite package, I give full card breakdowns for every single fight on every single major organization every single week, even if we don't have a bet for it. So, for example, this weekend, I'm going to give a breakdown on every single fight and I'm going to tell you if I like any bets, all the bets I like on every fight, even if I don't bet it, even if I don't have a bet on it, I'm going to do the breakdowns. On top of that, you get so much more stuff. You get the degenerate parlays. You get Lambo plays. You get the best prop bets. You get the best parlay piece. You get a lot of stuff on the Elite Package. So if you want to start signing up and making real money like myself from sports betting, it is possible. You can make a lot of money from sports betting. You just need to follow somebody who knows what they're doing, who's been in the game for 10 plus years, which is me. I've got the best service in the game, bar none. The track records show it. If you want to earn money, go to lucrativemmabetting.com. The link is also in the bio. The money I charge is absolute peanuts for the money that you will earn. I really should raise the price, but I want to have it accessible to everybody. So it's definitely a good weekend to sign up because I have many, many bets locked in and max bets locked in this weekend, which I'm basically undefeated on. But yeah, 33 and free. So yeah, we had some bets here. Look, Bellator continues to be a good event for us. Five units here. I'm going to scroll up and if there's any specific bets I want, I will... Um, any specific bets I like, I will... This, this is a bet that I definitely um, regret. So Adrian Yanez versus Rob Font. So the reason I bet this was because I knew that Rob Font, I, I thought, I believed Rob Font's chin to be done. I actually still do believe that. And I believe that Adrian Yanez was going to get clipped, but his chin was way too good. I basically thought that Yanez is going to crack Font and he won't be able to take it. Font's going to crack Yanez and he won't be able to take it. I overestimated Yanez's chin. Yanez had never fought anyone with that firepower before. Yanez had never fought anyone on that level before, but I still thought his chin would do the bits and I thought his chin would be amazing. So I definitely regret that. I regret fading someone as a big favorite, taking a big step up in competition. So I faded Rob Font, even though Yanez was taking a massive step up in competition. And I knew that Yanez was going to take a couple of shots. I just thought Rob Font's chin is dust and this is an easy bet. It was the level difference. I will fade him again, but not with a guy who had not fought nowhere near at that level. So, yeah, so it's just, it's just a bad bet all round from me. You know, not only did I lay chalk, but I also faded a guy who has fought at the top levels like the upper echelon of the division for the whole time. And now he's taking a massive step down in competition. And I want to fade him at chalk. It was just a silly play. Sometimes you can get too fixed on outcomes, guys. This is another jewel I'm dropping. There's so much that you can learn from this video. Another jewel that I'm dropping that I, I often make mistakes on, and I've done it here with Yanez, is that you can get fixated on outcomes. If that outcome doesn't happen, then how's your bet going to look? I was fixated on Yanez knocking Rob Font out. I'm like, Rob Font's chin is dust. He has to knock him out. How can he not? He's got good boxing. If he doesn't knock him out, though, how is he going to look? Now, we didn't really get to see because Rob Font ended up knocking him out. But I was so fixated on Yanez getting a knockout 
that I completely disregarded Rob Font knocking him out. I completely disregarded the step up in competition for Giannis. So in hindsight, that was an easy bet on Rob Font. But I let my fixation on Rob Font getting knocked out take away from it. So, yeah, what else do we have here? So, I mean, this was one of my best events of the year in terms of money line bets, in my opinion, because I had Steven Garcia as an underdog against Yilan Shah, which is crazy because he um, he obviously, you know, knocked him out and he looked really good. I also had the under two and a half rounds in that spot. So it was literally a perfect, perfect, um, perfect for me. I also played the under four and a half rounds in a Pereira and Israel Adesanya fight at almost evens, minus 105, which was a mad line considering their previous fights. But I also played Sam Hughes at plus 200 and Christian Rodriguez at plus 200, plus 190, which was insane lines when you go back and look at them. Um, Rodriguez should have been a favorite. Sam Hughes should have probably been um, even money. So, yeah, just really, really good bets all around there. Then we had the PFL. What else we got here? Um, yeah, Shane Burgos, just a bad bet. Um, Shane Burgos was never that good to begin with. I kind of overrated him in that spot. I don't like. I, I don't really have a massive regret on that bet. Um, I just think my read was just really wrong. So I just I regret the read. I should have my read should have been better, but. I mean, I, look how many bets I've made. We've gone through. How many bets have we gone through? Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm going to make bad bets. It is what it is. And that was one of them. So, yeah, I don't regret anything massively about that. Um, I don't think my strategy or anything was extremely wrong. I just think I had a really bad read on Burgos. I thought Burgos was better than he was. Even in his last fight, he didn't show to be that good. So, yeah. Um, Ahmed Amir, yeah, I, I, uh, that was just a bad, again, that was just a bad read. Um, Nishikawa. Not a terrible read. Under two and a half rounds, really, really good read. Um, Delano Taylor, plus 320 against Umalov. He got knocked out in about 30 seconds. Um, I also played it over one and a half rounds. Look, like it's weird, guys, because I think all of my bets here, I don't think the strategy was wrong or going in. I did anything majorly wrong, especially at the Lions. I mean, you're talking about plus 220 on Nishikawa, which was, I mean, he was kicking the legs off him. Plus 320 on Delano Taylor. Um, under two and a half rounds, should have cashed multiple times. I don't really think there's massive things to learn from my betting strategy here. I just think I had bad reads on a lot, a couple of the fights. Definitely on the Amir and Burgos fight. And the other fights, they were fine in my opinion. Um, yeah. So moving on. We smashed LFA there. Um, again, another weekend where the regional scene profits. So you make more money if you was on the regional scene. Um, elite package. And then this was obviously a massive, massive weekend for us. Um, I laid out a massive amount of units here, but they was over many, 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 many positions. And obviously I did that for a reason. Um, we destroyed the money lines here, absolutely destroyed them. I cashed on Denise Gomez, a plus 170 against Bruno Brazil. Daniel Zell, Huber. Um, Brandon Royval, plus 180 against Nicolau was good. Bill Algio against TJ Brown. Pedro Munoz, one of my favorite spots, plus 180 against Chris Gutierrez. Kutalaba, Max Holloway over Arnold Allen. Like, I, we really, really smashed the money lines here. Um, do I have any regrets? Billy Quarantino against Edson Barboza. I don't have any regrets. I honestly think Billy Quarantino was, um, was on his way to finishing him. Edson just caught a flying knee like he can do. I, I honestly don't think that was a bad bet, even at minus 140. Uh, no, minus 160. I still think that, I honestly still think that was a decent, I, I don't think that was a bad bet at all, to be honest. Um, what I do think was a bad bet was Piero Rodriguez over Julian Robinson. That was a very bad bet because... I mean, it's just my read. It's just a really bad read again. I mean, it's not like the strategy wasn't extremely wrong. It's just a read. Um, but the strategy was also wrong because Pierre Rodriguez was taking a step up in competition and Julian Robinson was taking a step down in competition. On top of that, my read was really wrong because I thought that Rodriguez would have the stuff to take downs, but she, uh, she wasn't. Julian got the takedowns and completely dominated her on the mat. So, yeah, 
Nothing massively stands out, but definitely some mistakes there. Ed Herman at plus 180 against Zach Cummins. That was a bad bet. Um, again, betting strategy-wise, I don't think it's terrible just because both fighters were, I think, coming off big layoffs. I think Zach Cummins was coming off like three, four years, and he was moving up in weight class. It's just that I'll, I'll always fade that type of fighter at big plus money, like Ed Herman plus 180, but yeah. Um this was really annoying. Um, Deanna Bennett was in like a was dominant, was winning the fight easy until she got submitted in the last round. Marcus Breno looked decent, but Sabatello ended up finishing him, so I won't say much about that. And then, yeah, that was just tough to be honest. Um, what else we got to say here? This Bellator card was complete bullshit. Charlie Leary was looking like the favorite until he got knocked out, but fair enough, you can get knocked out. Justin Gonzalez, terrible bet over Mads Burnell, I must admit. Bobby King, man, he had that fight against Elon Cruz. He kind of fucked up there. Kasim Aras, he should have won that fight. It was a split decision. In my opinion, he deserved to win. At plus 360 to lose a split decision, that's when that's when you just have to cry, you know. Um, but, yeah, I could go through this all day, guys. I don't really have too much more to say. Um we had a massive win in this event, loss in a one-fight night event, but the, a win and rise in the winning cage warriors, um, massive win in the UFC. Yeah, I think I'm think I'm gonna call it. I think I'm gonna call it there, guys, because I'm starving now. I'm hungry. It's uh, 7 p.m. I need some food, and not only that, but I've got some work to do. So, yeah, I could go through this more, but. I'm just going to leave it there for now. We had a lot of bets this year. It's been an amazing year, man. And if you've got any questions, ask me questions now because I'm going to answer a few questions before I go. But, yeah, I just want to say, like, it's been it's been a really, really good year. Um, one of the best years I've ever had. As I said, I've made over $100,000 just this year from betting on MMA, which is really good considering it's only been six months. You know, I'm going to try and grow it in, and earn any more money. And if you want to earn money directly with me, you can go to lucrativemmabetting.com. You can sign up, get all my official picks and predictions and get instant access to me and I can help you along with your betting process as well. So, yeah, I'm just going to keep on chugging along, man. It's been an amazing year. We keep winning. Um, we've won 91 units this year with an 11, with a 10% ROI. So, I think my best ever year is like 110 unit year. But that's over... That's over 12 months. So, of course, I can go on a downswing and lose money now. But I don't think we're going to lose over a six-month period. We're going to win. So, I'm going to definitely cross that 100-unit barrier this year. And I'm looking to do it this weekend. I have a max bet in play this weekend. Not only do I have a max bet, but I have multiple other underdogs. And not only that, I'm going to add about another six or seven more bets in before the before the weekend comes. So it's going to be a massive, massive week for me. And like I said, if you want to sign up, hit the link in bio and you can do it. I'll answer some questions before I go now. Um, Marco saying, trust me, all the haters come out of the world wets when you are successful. Yeah, that's the way of the world. It's been pretty funny to see. Imagine not having something better to do in your life. Yes, bro. The yin and yang of the world, the light and the dark, the haters and the successful. It's polarity, you know? It's uh, it's the way the world is. It's the natural order of the universe. James Baker is saying, can you talk about your unit progression? I mean, what do you mean specifically, bro? I mean, I started from, you know, 10 pounds, started betting five pound bets. And now I'm betting $10,000 bets on some bets. Now I'm betting $40,000 bets if I can get my money down on certain accounts when I can at the time. So, I mean, I, I, my biggest bets I've made are $50,000. Um so yeah, it's just it's just about you just have to keep going, man. Like, and one thing I'll say as well is you need to keep increasing your bankroll. Like, put more money in your bankroll when you get more money. If you are a positive EV gambler, you can trust your money safe in a betting account, right? As long as you're not using a dodgy betting account or doing anything against their rules. Um, keep putting money. Like, I think this is something that gets lost sometimes. It's like. To build up your bankroll, you're going to build it up by betting, but you should also be building it up by other means. So, for example, when I was first gambling, 
my bankroll was say 500 pounds. If I earned money on the side doing other stuff, which I did, extracurricular activities, jobs, side hustles, whatever you want to call it, I put that money in my betting fund as well. So my outside of the my outside of the betting world was funding my betting world. And that's just going to fast track your progress. Of course, some people don't want to do it that way, but you're just going to be, it's going to take you a lot longer to get to where you want to get to. If you know for a hundred percent fact that you are a positive EV gambler or you're tailing a positive EV gambler like myself, then you have you should not worry at all about putting more money into your account because you know that's just going to go up in time. It's it's much better than putting it into a bank account. Instead of holding your money in the bank account, put it in your betting account. It's going to allow you to increase your unit size so you can bet more. So your bankroll is going to be bigger and your unit progression is going to happen faster. It's much better than just putting $100 in your bankroll and then hopefully in two years making it $500, four years making it $1,000, 10 years making it $100,000. Like It's just going to be faster. Put more money into your bankroll as much as possible, especially if you're starting low. I don't need to. My bankroll is already massive, right? It's, what would you call that? Seven figures? is It's already over seven figures. I don't need to put loads of money in my bankroll now, right? I, it's self-sufficient. It's making, I have enough money that I can even get down on bookies, right? So I don't need to add more money into my bankroll. But when I was first starting off, I was adding money into my betting account all the time. I went through many bankrolls because I was just bad at betting, but I also added loads more money to my bankroll. So I think that's something that people don't understand. They think that when they gamble, they're just going to start with $500 and then in 10 years, turn it to 50 grand. And while that's possible, it's going to take you a lot longer because if you have $500, your bets are going to be $5, right? But if you, that's why I always say, put the most money possible into your bank uh, into your betting account and keep adding to it. Because then your unit size increases. As your bankroll increases, your unit size increases. And you want your unit size to increase as fast as possible. So why wouldn't you let your bankroll increase as fast as possible by putting more money into it? This is an investment. You need to play the smart game. Like I said, if you are a positive EV gambler, there's literally nothing to worry about. You will profit long term. So why are you worried about putting it in a betting account versus putting it in your bank account. It doesn't make sense to me. That's a broke mindset. It's a loser mindset. It's like saving $50 every week. You're trying to save yourself rich. It's not going it, it's not going to work. You can't save yourself rich. So, yeah, I hope that explains a little bit. You know, if you want to be a bit more specific in your question, I can ask, but yeah. Thoughts on Cody's PRP approach. Faith picks at top pays for yeah, I mean, it's a par. It's they're fun bets, you know. They're fun bets. It, it, it's it's a parlay at the end of the day. Um, pro professional gamblers who make money full time, they're obviously not betting ten leg parlays consistently as a way to make money, but they're definitely um, they're fun bets, you know. And if he hits one or two lines, then the rest, it, then he's free rolling on the others. So. Yeah, I've got nothing bad to say about Cody. I would just say that if you're speaking about full-time gamblers, that's definitely not how they're gambling. But I also do big leg parlays as well. But I do them for fun. I don't do them to make serious money. Not saying you can't hit one or two a year and make a lot of money. It is possible, especially if you have an edge over the market. It is going to happen. I know last year, I think he hit two. You know, And depending on how much money you're having on them, that could pay for the whole year, really. But if you want to learn consistent uh, long-term income, week to week, month to month, year to year, over a long sample size, obviously all full-time gamblers are betting singles, not even doubles, not even trebles. We bet singles and we try and get edge over each singular bet. Um, Chris is saying, thanks, good stuff. James is saying, scroll up. Yeah, I already answered that question. Gus is saying, uh, money bag. We know we're going to make a lot of money bags this week. Daz is saying, how is your betting different than this time last year? If your betting strategy is different, that is. Yeah, so one thing I realized last year, Daz, was that my a lot of my losses came from sizing. So, for example, I'd put five units on one bet 
and one unit on the other bets. And the five unit bet might lose and the one unit bets might win, which meant that I was having an issue with sizing. So this year, I purposely wanted to streamline the sizing and play a more straight up approach as to where I was sizing the bets similarly on every bet. If you go through my record now, you won't see that many bets drastically different. You're not really going to see one bet being one unit and one bet being six unit, one bet being three unit and one bet being half a unit. Unless they're big props and stuff, you have to size down. Of course, I'm not putting two units on a massive prop. But for the most part, um, I'm doing a more of a streamlined approach. Two units on most bets. If I really like it, I'll go four units. Two and a half units on the majority of bets. If I don't really like it, I'll go one unit. But on average, for the most part, the bet sizing is a lot more close than they were last year. There was too much swings last year. And I did this. I went through all of my bets and I realized the mistakes I was making. And uh, that was one of them. So that's what I've shored up this year. Um, that would be the main thing, I would say. Gus is saying, I learned a lot of you, mate. Thank you for these streams and vid. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, bro. I'm happy to help. That's what I want to do. Like I said, I'm happy to break down fights every week. But at the end of the day, even if I told you told you that Drickus Duplessis is a good bet over Robert Whitaker, like I did last week, or even if I tell you that Alejandro Pantoja is a good bet over Brandon Moreno, like I did last week on this channel, you can only use that piece of information once. Yes, it's good. Yes, you're going to be happy. Yes, you might make a tweet saying thank you, lucrative. Yes, you might do these things, but that will only happen one time. Whereas if I do a video like this and I go through my betting process and my strategy and I give you detailed information on how to increase your unit size and how to look at fights objectively and stuff like this, you're not going to use that piece of information once like you did for the Pantoja and Duplessis piece of information. You're going to use these pieces of information for the rest of your betting career. So I think these are way more important. And honestly, if you've made it this far, you are ahead of 99% of the people in the world because most people will see a video like this and they won't watch it. They'll watch it for five minutes and they'll be like, fuck this. I just want to know who's going to win this fight on the weekend so I can make money. Yay. Like you are so far ahead of anyone else because you're actually trying to develop your betting process and your betting strategy versus who's going to win this weekend, Lucrative Holly Holm, is she value? It's, it's so much more of a winner's mindset. It's so much more of a long-term mindset that you're going to do just fine. So like I said, if you have made it this far, shout out to you because you've done very well. And I actually urge you to look at my breakdowns, my full card breakdown, to see how many views they get. They get 2K views every video. And my gambling guides, how to make money gambling, to which I have a lot on my, uh, on my YouTube, they have 300 views, 400 views. But it's so funny because those videos will literally make people a hundred times the amount of money than the full card breakdowns do. But the full card breakdowns have a hundred times the views of the other videos. So it's funny. The world is backwards. Everybody's backwards in this world. People are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, yeah, the world's backwards. But So it's easy to crush it in this day and age because the world's backwards. So if you actually forward thinking and do what you're supposed to do, you're going to earn way more money in the long term because no one else is doing it. So you don't you don't have a big market to compete with. It's not hard to do almost anything in life now because the market's so small. People are not doing anything. So yeah, without me going on another rant for 10 minutes, uh, thank you, Gus. And that's it, man. I'm off now. Daz is saying thanks a million, James. About 130% increase of bankroll. Yeah. Shout out to Daz. Daz uh, signed up with me. And as you can see, he's increased his bankroll by 130%. If you want to increase your bankroll by 130% and or more, you can go to the link in the bio, lucrativemmabetting.com. But that's it. Thanks, everybody, in the chat. If you are still here, like the video. It only takes a second, and it pushes me out more in the algorithm. If I get more out in the algorithm, I want to do more videos. Also, comment, because comment is massive for the algorithm as well. So that's it. Um, Yodman's saying, can I please clear this up? You haven't asked me anything, bro. So unless you're trolling, I'm going to shoot off in about 30 seconds. 
and I'm going to go and eat some dinner. I don't know what to have today. Might have my lamb shoulder. Or might just have some chicken. So you're not 100% sure. So I'm waiting for Yod Man to um, type something out. Or maybe he's not. I give you like another 20 seconds, bro. So if you want to type something, you better do it now. Good card this weekend. I'll probably... Um, I'll probably be out with a video for this card maybe in the next day or two. If you want a breakdown for the card, let me know. I'm really not motivated for this card. I put one out last week, but this card is terrible. Going from last week to this week is insane. It's such a bad card this week. It's a good card for betting, though. If you want a breakdown, just let me know. Maybe I'll summon up the energy to do it. I don't have that much motivation to do these breakdowns anymore, but I still like talking about fighting and I definitely like talking about gambling. That's why I'm doing it. Um, that's why I like doing these videos. But yeah, that's it, guys. Let me know if you want a full card breakdown. If not, then I won't do one, but I'll be back in a few days with some other videos anyway. I have a lot more plans to do this, uh, these type of videos um, in the future. So yeah, thanks for watching. Good luck on your bets this weekend and I'll see you on the other side.